from KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. On air and online, this is Intersection. Hello and welcome to Intersection, where people and ideas meet online and on KBIA. I'm Ryan Femuliner. Over the next few weeks, civic leaders will continue to pour over the details of City Manager Mike Mathis's proposed annual budget in advance of an expected vote by City Council next month. The $414 million city budget, which was unveiled last month, reflects Mathis's insistence on ending deficit spending from the city's general fund. Some of the changes announced in the budget include hiring three additional police staff, retooling the city's public transit system, and cutting funding to CAT TV. This also comes as city leaders discuss whether the police department needs to add new officers and how to find money to pay for them. Today on Intersection, we'll take a closer look at the proposed fiscal year 2014 budget and find out what it could mean for Columbia if approved and talk about some of the other issues facing the city. Joining me in studio, Mike Mathis has been the Columbia City Manager since 2011. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right. And we'd love to hear from you and our audience as well. This week we contacted some of our former guests on Intersection to see what questions they had for City Manager Mike Mathis, and we'll be bringing those questions in throughout the show. But we'd also love to include your questions to help guide the conversation. Just give us a call at 573-882-8925, or you can email intersection at kbia.org. You could also tweet us at intersectkbia. Um, so to start off, um, one of the big stories over the past few weeks has been uh, this proposal to possibly fund um, new police officers in the city. Uh, the mayor actually proposed it, uh, a, a property tax, and that's kind of in limbo, if not dead at the moment. I, I wonder uh, what your thoughts are on that property tax proposal to possibly create new funding for police officers in the city. Well, it, it, Fundamentally, it's, uh, it really comes down to whether uh, we already have enough money to hire more officers or we don't. Uh, any look at the budget is confusing. Uh, quite honestly, it's 550 pages. Uh, it's about the most boring thing you'll ever read. Uh, and that's because it's just numbers, filled numbers, very little uh, language, English language in it. So part of my challenge is always to try to translate what that means to, to you and me and everyone in the, in the community. So the first uh, 20 pages or so really try to do that. There's uh, more words and fewer numbers in those <laughs> as a summary. And so what it uh, attempts to do is really present in a simple way uh, answers to questions like that. And mm -hmm. uh, the truth is, you know, there isn't a magic pot of money out there that's not being spent or that we have. You know, we've, we've just come through a recession. We've cut every budget in the city uh, significantly. Uh, you know, I, I sort of highlight the city council. Uh, they led the way. They cut two-thirds of their budget in mm -hmm. the last five years. Uh, most administrative departments are down 30 percent. So there's not uh, there's not money out there. Mm -hmm. Some well, people have, you know. Yeah, and yeah, you're probably referring to the Columbia Police Officers Association and some others that had said there was some money they thought that was out there, mm -hmm. um, the money that's going toward uh, overtime for police officers so far in previous years, and also this money for the 911 call center that um, is was kind of all of a sudden there's this money available uh, around $2 million that um, was going to that, that now it will be replaced by funding through this uh, new tax that was passed mm -hmm. last year. So so what about those? Uh, uh, it's using that money. You're saying basically that that's not feasible, I guess. Right. Uh, so the first thing, let's take the uh, 911 money. That's uh, $1.8 million that the city spends now. Uh, and uh, so we have to remember this in context. We are spending uh, this year $1.3 million more than we're bringing in in revenue. So the budget I propose for next year uh, ends that practice. It balances the budget. So the first $1.3 million uh, has to go to fund that deficit. So that okay. oh, another way to think about it is we've already spent $1.3 million of that on the general fund, so on public safety. And so what the savings really is from that change is about half a million dollars. And, and where's that money going? Well, to 911, funny enough, because we're carrying that function the first uh, quarter of the fiscal year. So to January 1st, we'll be paying for 911 the way we always have with our partners. And, uh, and that's to make sure we don't uh, drop the baton in the handoff, so to speak. And that's due to the nature of the tax. So the sales tax takes a while to begin to come in to the coffers of the county, and that really doesn't hit till January. So we need to carry it to January, and then the savings start to accrue. And so what that means in 2014, the next budget, is uh, there really isn't a savings realized till 2015. 
Okay. And then at that point, we'll just reevaluate where we are, I guess. And well, uh, actually, the council's already decided to dedicate that savings to public safety. And so okay. knowing that, we, we've sort of uh, gone ahead and hired folks ahead of time, knowing that this funding will be there to pick it up. And the fire department did a great job, got a grant, uh, had applied for it for many years, didn't get it. This year, they got it. So it's, uh, it's a bit of karma, maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we have to pick up the cost of that grant. We added five firefighters uh, with that, and so we have to pick that up in two years. That That's what this funding will help us do, and we're going to add three officers. So okay. It's not that half a million is not quite enough to cover all of it, but we'll we'll be able to cover all of it okay. when we get there. Yeah, and those you mentioned those numbers that we're at right now, three new police officers. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the discussions that you know, when the mayor originally proposed this property tax, he was throwing out this number of 30, 35 officers. Uh, the CPOA was having a similar number, maybe even thirty eight. I think was the number I saw at one point. What do you think about that number of three? Is that is that enough at this point? Or what do you think about the possibility of increasing police staff? Uh, it's all we can do with the resources we have. Uh, moving forward, barring any future recessions, so we know that won't be forever, but uh, we can do one or two added positions each year is a, is a reasonable, rational expectation. And that's because uh, over time sales tax revenue does increase. Uh, now, the funny thing is it's it's increased at a much slower rate than it has in the past, and so we can get into what Amazon's doing to our <laughs> revenue. But, uh, uh, yeah, so there is more money there, but it's not a huge amount. So the most we can do is, is have one or two added positions each year. Uh, this year we're able to do three because of the 911 uh, tax passing. So... Uh, but you look at that in context to compare our staffing levels to any city our size with a university our size in the country, and we are lower. We're 30 percent smaller uh, than other cities our size. So is uh, the university's uh, police department. So yeah, many people say, well, you know, you have to add them to be apples to apples. That comparison is the same if you add them. We're still together 30 percent smaller than the mm -hmm. equivalent in other cities so that's why that 35 number 38 number depends on how many um, you're trying to get to uh, but if you get to average you need at least 30 officers to get there okay and at, at the work session over the weekend there was a work session where city council and some leaders look up, look over this budget i think i, I read an article i read you were quoted as saying if we were going to try to add new officers now we would need some new revenue so yes. what are there were you talking about anything in particular there when you said new revenue? What what could you see yeah. as possibilities for this? Uh, well, my point is you can't get 30 officers in the current budget. You know, almost you know the vast majority of our general fund dollars are already committed to public safety. There's not enough money there to, to fund 30 more officers. Uh, so you have to get you have to get a new source of revenue in some way, whether that's a property tax or a sales tax or something else. Uh, if you don't want to pay more, we can approach it with, we'll just see how many we can squeeze into the budget each year. And there is growth, and so you can do one or two, maybe three a year. Okay. So a 10-year plan would get us there or, uh, or, or raise the tax now. Okay. And so going back to that idea of the property tax, if, if the city council were to, did decide to move forward with that, would, what would your stance be on that? Well, my opinion doesn't matter, of course, because okay. uh, I work for the council, right? They're the decision maker, and they're the public policy body. All my job really becomes is to say, is there money there or not? And what are the options if we don't want to raise taxes? What could we do? And so I, I've done that, and uh, uh, that's the kind of conversation I can have with Okay. With anyone. Okay. I want to take a moment to remind our listeners that this is Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Femuliner, and today Columbia City Manager Mike Mathis is joining us in studio to talk about his proposed city budget for next year and about what it could mean for Columbia if approved. We're also talking about some of the other issues facing the city. And for you and our audience, do you think the city of Columbia needs more police officers? If so, how do you think the city should pay for them? Give us a call at 573-882-8925 or email intersection at kbia.org. You could also tweet us at Intersect KBIA. We'd like to remind you that you can watch Intersection as streaming video online during our live conversations every Monday afternoon at 2 at KBIA.org. You can watch that video and join our online chat by going to KBIA.org and scrolling down to the link for Intersection. Again, that's Mondays at 2 online 
at kbia.org. Um, I mentioned earlier in the show that we curated some questions from mm -hmm. uh, some of our past guests, and I wanted to bring one of those uh, questions in here. Uh, Brent Gardner is a Columbia real estate agent and chairman of the Downtown Columbia Leadership Council. He asked, do you think there's a connection between Columbia's increase of students living downtown and the recent wave of late night violence downtown? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's the short answer. The long answer, uh, you know, that's something I've heard, you know, kind of kicked around. And I say no because uh, of the details of the crimes that have happened. Uh, if you look at the folks uh, that are involved in those crimes, they're not uh, college students. Okay. What do you think, too, though, about that is a, a new reality downtown where we have those college students. What do you think about the clash between, I don't want to say clash, but the fact that that population that is some, in, in some ways the lifeblood of this town in many ways um, is now close to some of this, mm -hmm. um, th these violent acts and, and that, you know, what, what does that say for the city going forward? Sure. Uh, good question. You know, the interesting thing is um, big picture nationwide statistical level uh, pr presence of uh, law abiding folks pushes away crime. So uh, the best way, for example, to take back a park or a neighborhood is to have everybody go out of their house, you know, and be out there. It's interesting how criminals don't, they want to be very isolated and alone and in the dark. And so uh, having folks living downtown is one of the best things we can do to lower crime rate downtown. Now that said, it's still a worry and we still have crime downtown, there's no question. Uh, it's a lot lower than people think, uh, which, you know, I can tell you the statistics and tell you that you're half as likely to be a victim of crime in Columbia as you were 10 years ago. It doesn't make you feel better when <laughs> there's a shooting at 10th and Broadway, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with both um, how it feels, how we all feel about crime, and, and then the reality of it. So for us to do that, we really dig in on each individual crime. And I, I just got to take a moment and really praise the police department. Our, uh, our detectives division, our vice narcotics division, uh, the whole department's done a great job. At this point, all the bad guys from this last summer have been caught and apprehended. So they're, they're doing a great job. And that's because, you know, they dig in and do the hard day-to-day -day work of the police department. Sure. You know, where you go and you get someone's cell phone records and you follow up on every single call and you figure out who they're talking to, what they said. Then you go talk to them. Then you, So it, these, are, these are the kind of methodic things that take quite a while, but they, uh, they result in good outcomes. Sure. And I, I'll go back to when the mayor introduced that uh, proposal for the property tax. He mentioned, he, he, for, I'm not sure why, but he went ahead and uh, spelled out the, the um, power structure at the city and pointed out that you, you are the person that oversees mm -hmm. directly keep Chief Ken Burton. Um, I wonder, because there's been a lot of discussion about this, CPOA and others have, have kind of, have been vocal about their lack of confidence in, keep, in Chief Ken Burton. I, I wonder where you are on that. Are you confident in him at this moment? I'm 100% confident in Chief Burton. He does a great job with uh, an incredible amount of insubordination from CPOA and others. Uh, our system allows for insubordination, unfortunately. You know, you think about other systems like uh, the county government, the sheriff, where 100% of their employees are at will. Uh, you better not pull that kind of stuff there, right? And most people wouldn't allow their own businesses to be run uh, the way we must uh, and with our current approach. So, you know, it's unfortunate. Um, for many other reasons, uh, this group uh, has decided to take some tactics that have really never worked in our history in America, but uh, they really believe in it. Uh, kind of old school, uh, you think of these when you think of old school unions, you know, kind of smear campaigns and things like that. Uh, so, you know, to, to dig into it, I talked to everyone and, uh, you know, you, you reference, you know, kind of the, the things you hear, mm -hmm. the rumor mill, and I would always follow up, what do you mean, you know, what makes you not have confidence? How, how is it that this chief is so uh, so bad you know what and what you end up with are very petty uh, things one example a recent retiree uh, still extremely mad that we deleted uh, take-home vehicles he had to buy a car for the first time in his in his life uh, so okay that doesn't that would be embarrassing I think if if uh, you admitted that publicly but uh, uh, so those are the sources of a lot of it. A lot of it, quite honestly, is this chief has done exactly what he's been asked to do, come in and modernize this department. Uh, we have a lot of very talented, very dedicated folks, but our, our processes, our policies were very old-fashioned. So 
Uh, a good example is our property room. Mm -hmm. This is something that went public uh, last year, I think. Uh, the chief came in and did an audit of how we uh, deal with um, things that we seize at, at crime scenes and, and others, and uh, it was incredibly sloppy. And uh, so best practice is much different than our practice was. Mm -hmm. So the chief changed our way of doing business. That was unpopular with some, and I will say very small number, but they are vocal. Uh, those changes. Most officers realize, hey, this is a good change, and we're, we're into it. You know, CPOA is, I would say, fairly fractured right now. I get more calls from staff after their press conferences saying uh, that they're embarrassed and they're angry with CPOA for not asking their members if they should do a press conference or if they agree with their uh, public stance. Okay. So, uh, I guess... Yeah, it, it, I, then there's been some surveys on this or studies done on the, on the department that basically have said this morale really is a problem, I guess. So mm -hmm. do, do we need to have a change in the way things are done? As far, you talked about that, that basically institutionally we, we have ability, we have we kind of foster this in, insubordination in some ways because of the way things are set up. Do you think there needs it. to be yeah, allow it, I guess. Yeah. Does there need to be a change, I guess? Well, I'll tell you, you know, uh, there was a, a, uh, the first indication uh, – I'm looking back at history. This is before Chief Burton, before I got here. So I'm 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 going to recite to you what I read in the files and in the in the press. Uh, there's been a, an issue between the community and the police department for two decades, where the community felt like the police department was being too heavy-handed, too militarized, and they forced change. So they created the CP um, uh, Columbia Police Review Board. Citizens Police Review Board. So oh, civilian oversight of the police department. That predates this chief or me, and I think is a pretty big indication of where the community feels like uh, the, the police department was. Uh, and then they hired a chief that was a very uh, public process. The community hired this chief, and they hired someone from outside the department. That's pretty rare, and it's usually done when the community doesn't have faith in the department, right? So there was a big disconnect there. I believe this chief's gone a long way to try to heal those uh, those wounds. A CPOA has not helped. They uh, they have resented in the past uh, the fact that we have a chief from outside of the department. I will note there's a lot of positive uh, growth in the CPOA. So uh, uh, you know there's that we've gone through some rocky uh, phases, but I, I see hope for the future there. Uh, so, bottom line, uh, this is, we have a great chief. Uh, he he has uh, had to deal with things no other law enforcement chief would have to deal with, uh, partly due to our our system of allowing that sort of thing. But you know, I challenge any reporter who hears that sort of rumor to dig in and ask probing questions. You know, uh, why is the morale bad? And you know, mm -hmm. what has this chief done to really uh, uh, instill a lack of confidence? Because he's uh, he's got tremendous confidence of the community. Okay. I want to take a moment to remind our listeners that this is Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Fumulner, and today Columbia City Manager Mike Mathis is joining us in studio to talk about his proposed city budget for next year and about what it could mean for Columbia if approved. We're also talking about some of the other issues facing the city. We'd also love to hear from you in our audience. Do you have any questions for the city manager? Let us know. Give us a call at 573-882-8925 or email intersection at kbia.org. You could also tweet us at intersection. KBIA. Uh, this might be a good time to bring in another comment that we had from, uh, again, we uh, got some uh, comments from some of our past guests before the show, questions they would have for you. We talked to Don Love with the Missouri Associ Association of Social Welfare Human Rights Task Force. He said, I support more police officers, especially if they're used in a community policing approach, but I support a broad range of other unrelated initiatives aimed at making Columbia a healthier, more inclusive community. It's possible to support popular, popular initiatives by voting on dedicated tax increases, but the ones without a powerful enough group of supporters get nothing. We need an adequate police force, but we also need adequate human services. What can you do to ensure a balance? You know, I think that is well said uh, by Mr. Love. The, uh, and I do agree, you know, crime has many causes. It's uh, one metaphor that's used is it's kind of like cancer, right? There's, there's hundreds of causes of cancer, and you, there's not going to be one thing that cures cancer, right? There's going to be hundreds of treatments, hundreds of related 
uh, ways to, to, to cure that. So, and, and we, make, we have made progress on some, but not all, right? Crime is very similar, and it does require more than police officers uh, to, to solve. You do have to have that social network side of it and those social supports. Uh, one thing we can be proud of in Columbia is that we do have many of those. And uh, the thing that the council recognizes is uh, maybe we don't have all of them, or maybe the ones we have aren't funded at a high enough level. So what they've done is create a task force to look at that gap analysis. How, you know, what, what are our approaches that are working? Where are we missing? Where do we need more? And some of that, I, I have to believe, will surely be community policing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, as Mr. Love rightly points out, that's one of the many things we need to do. Unfortunately, it's complicated. And uh, at the end of the day, you have a society that has said there's behavior we won't accept, but individuals decide whether they're going to comply with those uh, or not. And so it's really complicated. There's hundreds of reasons why people make bad decisions and don't do that. And uh, we, we need to address all of it if we're going to have a hope of, of lowering the crime rate. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, what can the city do other than saying it's important? Maybe is there anything in the budget to try to kind of bolster that community policing, that idea? What have other yes. towns done? Yes, uh, so the three positions we're adding uh, will be community police-based uh, positions. And what that means is, you know, rather than be uh, in patrol and uh, chasing call after call after call, which is our current approach, we're, we are understaffed. The calls have gone up as the community has grown. And so we really don't have time to be, quote, proactive in the sense that uh, our, our officers answer a call. The moment they're done with that, there's another call waiting. So they go to that, and there's another call. So they don't have time to really think about, okay, How's, how are things looking in this neighborhood? Uh, they're driving street right. So now we do have some folks that do that, and I don't want to. I don't want to have anyone believe that it's all or nothing here. But it's to a much larger extent than it used to be. That's the case. So these three officers, and what I mean by community policing is, they're going to have the time to get to know a neighborhood, and we're going to put them in the neighborhood that has the highest call volume, right? So. We're going to try to address our issues there. They're going to develop personal relationships with every man, woman, and child in the neighborhood that they can so that when something bad happens, that neighborhood does have the faith and the trust in the department so that they will call us and tell us what they know. If you think about it, every one of the shootings we had in May and June were the big months, by the way. Somebody in this community knew all of the facts of that. And uh, in almost all the cases, they wouldn't tell us. So uh, we have to come at it sideways. We have to get cell phone records. We have to find other proof. We have to use video footage and uh, bring people in who say, I wasn't there. You weren't there? Is this you? You know? <laughs> oh, well, I was there. <laughs> all right, so now you want to tell me what you were doing, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, and, you know, I get it. Human nature, you don't want to get in any trouble, right? But uh, uh, we have to as a community get to the point where we're willing to tell the police what we know, especially when, uh, you know, our neighbor or our cousin or nephew might be involved in gang activity. Uh, if we care about them, we should uh, inter intervene with them and try to get them out of it. And if they are mixed up in something bad, the best thing is to, to let the cops know so that we can intervene early. Mm -hmm. Another, another thing that was brought up over in that um, that session over the weekend where you looked at the budget, uh, Councilmember Mike Trapp brought up the idea of taxes on cigarettes or alcohol, uh, that type of thing. Do you mm -hmm. think there are other possible revenue sources for, for this or for other things in the budget? I oh, guess. certainly. There are many uh, things that may or may not be more or less palatable to the community. Uh, Palatable? Did I say that right? <laughs> I think you did. Yes. Uh, so yes, sin taxes. People generally call that. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're you're taxing behavior that's that's bad. And and uh, you know, the thing about cigarette taxes, uh, once you every tax increase on cigarettes re results in uh, less sales. So actually, one of the most effective anti-smoking uh, campaign um, uh, tasks is raising taxes on it. People stop smoking. So uh, the problem with that is uh, the funding goes down over time. So you can't really rely on it for long-term funding of things we really care about. It's great to fund programs that are kind of one-offs or only needed for a short period of time.
Okay. So, so for, again, for a, a addition to the police force, that may not be a good long-term strategy. Uh, at this point, I am not going to turn sure. down any help from, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, long-term, it may not be as compelling as, uh, say a property tax, which is the most, um, stable source of revenue. There are a few things in the budget this year that will increase revenue, uh, not a ton, but some of these fees. Can you talk a little about those? Not not related to police, I don't think. Yes, there are a few minor fee increases, I would say. Probably the most important one and most exciting in, in many ways is uh, an increase in the parking permit fees, $10 a month if you park in one of the city garages. Uh, that money will be used then uh, to – we'll put that into the transit uh, budget – uh, the federal government will then match dollar for dollar all of those dollars. So that increase balances the transit budget in exchange for the increase uh, in, uh, so it would take the average, I think, from uh, $60 a month to $70 a month, if I'm remembering right. And in exchange, you would get uh, an all-access pass to the bus system. So not only do you get to park in, in the ramp, you get a, a pass on the bus system. The, and that's more valuable than it used to be. Uh, it used to be uh, many people wouldn't use it because you can't really commute. You know, we only run until uh, 8 o'clock three days a week, and uh, so many people, it's not really a commute option now. We're in the beginning of an overhaul uh, called Como Connect, I'm very proud of that. Staff came up with this overhaul of the system, which mm -hmm. was very responsive to all of the things we've heard from all of our users, all of our customers, the community, uh, with help from PedNet and Comet to, to collect that uh, information. So uh, what we'll end up with, uh, rather than having the uh, sort of spoke and hub system we have now, where everything ends in, and begins at the Wabash bus station, uh, we're going to create just a network of routes. And so what that allows us to do is put buses farther away, right, because they don't have to get all the way back to the Wabash. We can now have this, uh, uh, basically this cross, length and breadth of the city, with neighborhood routes connected to them. So for the first time, you'll be able to get from anywhere in town to the other side of town on the bus. Mm -hmm. well, we'll talk more about that after a short break here. We have about 30 seconds, though. You guys are, uh, the city is looking into maybe some federal funding for this as well. Yes. In fact, uh, it's matched by federal funds. So all of those dollars go in. So we, we're locally going to put th about 300000 more in. The feds will give us then another 300000 which uh, gets us to 600000 for the annual increase in transit. Right. And it may be confusing. I think the acronym for that is actually TIGER, which may be just coincidental, oh, right? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yes. No, that's, of course, that is very confusing. There's yeah. another grant we've applied for yes. in addition to that called TIGER, which has a, uh, I'll we'll bore talk. you to death later. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Let's get to that after the break. We promise to bore you after the break. That's not true, though. <laughs> this is Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute today. Columbia City Manager Mike Mathis is joining us in studio to talk about his proposed city budget for next year and about what it could mean for Columbia if approved. We're also talking about some of the other issues facing the city. I'm Ryan Femuelner. We'll be right back after a short break.
Welcome back to Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Famuliner, and today Columbia City Manager Mike Mathis is joining us in studio to talk about his proposed city budget for next year and about what it could mean for Columbia if approved. We're also talking about some of the other issues facing the city. We'd love to hear from you and our audience as well. This week we contacted some of our former guests on Intersection to see what questions they had for City Manager Mike Mathis, and we'll be bringing those questions in throughout the show. But we'd also love to include your questions. Give us a call at 573-882-8924 five or email intersection at kbia.org you could also tweet us at intersect kbia or join our online chat um, and actually i'm going to go ahead and bring in a call uh, from barbie in columbia barbie are you there Hel hello barbie oh we lost her um, well, I think I have a little bit about her question here. Uh, my producer sent us that in the break. Um, she had a question about what's known as garagezilla downtown <laughs> um, she wanted to know how the extra floors, she says, got built beyond what the city council recommended. Well, uh, you know, that predates me. It was just open when I got here, I think a few months before. So uh, really that's um, history I don't, I'm not uh, very conversant with. Okay. I do believe um, that the council at the time decided to build higher because it couldn't uh, buy the whole block as originally envisioned. And so rather than use eminent domain to uh, force the sale of the whole block, they just bought half the block and then went higher. Now, that said, I will, I'm proud of the fact, by the way, that GarageZilla, or uh, Gary the Garage, some people call it, uh, is, uh, is fully leased, right? So all the spaces are leased. Uh, there were many people, I think, when it first opened that were critical that it, we didn't need that many spaces. Uh, the truth is we do. And uh, we are almost finished. We're this close, about a month away from finishing all the retail space on the first floor. And so all of that will be fully leased here in about a month. Okay. Well, now let's jump back to that conversation we were in the middle of before we had to go to the break, uh, talking about the overhaul, the transpo system. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about that Tiger funding. Let's get that, like you said, boring stuff out of yes, the way thank here. You. But that, that's a federal grant. I guess that it's, is this plan somewhat contingent on getting that money? or No, uh, we, we, I think, have done some very smart work. Again, very proud of transit staff. Uh, Tiger grants above and beyond uh, the overhaul. So Como Connect is this effort to completely reinvent transit. That's going to happen no matter if we get the grant or not. If we get the grant, we'll be able to do some things we wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, for example, rebuild all the shelters uh, so that they're sort of modernized. Imagine a bus shelter that has uh, space for bikes, uh, bike lockers. So you could ride your bike to the stop and it'll be there when you come back, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to haul it on the bus with you. Uh, full, uh, full digital information center so you can see where the bus is and when it'll be there. Uh, any other information about the bus, maps of the route, comfortable chairs to sit in, et cetera, out of the rain. And, uh -huh. well, well, so how long will this process take to, to get this Como Connect plan underway since it is such a big shift? Uh, great question. And uh, we all want it to happen next week, right? <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, because there's every level of government involved in this service, um, even the state contributes a little bit, a very little bit, but a little bit to the... <laughs> to the uh, uh, service, and because of that, they, uh, you know, it's their money, they get a, a, a say in how we do it. So we have to follow their rules about how we spend it. To do all that, it's going to take us about a year. So next summer, uh, we should be finished overhauling Como Connect. We've already started, and I want to tell everyone about it. Uh, there's an app, free app, called Double Map. Uh, you can go out and, and download it now on iPhone and uh, Android. And uh, it works well. It's on every route we have today, and it will tell you uh, where the buses are and how long you have to wait for any particular stop. So great app. Yeah. So what can you do? Uh, maybe offering things like that is one of the answers, but how, what can you do to get uh, people in the city to start using the bus system? That's one of the problems at the moment right now is that, it's, that there's right. not a lot of uses. So how do you get someone to use something that, you know, right now is just kind of a promise of what's to be? How, how, what, are, what strategies can the city use? Well, this Como Connect really does that. There's, there's a couple things that really get in the way of convincing people to try it. Uh, one is it doesn't, it's not really a commute option, and most folks work. And so getting to work and back, uh, you would do if you could, but you can't. So right now, you know, if you work past uh, 5 o'clock, you're not going to use the bus. You can't get home on Thursday or Friday, right? Como Connect will change that. You'll be, we'll run till 8 o'clock Monday through Saturday. Uh, so that's for the first time a 
uh, commuter option. Second thing, we're, we don't go to large parts of the community. You know, if you live on the southwest side, I'll give you my own personal example. If I wanted to take the bus, it would take me an hour to walk the three miles to the nearest bus stop. That's the closest bus stop to my house. Mm. And I live inside the city limits. So um, that's not really an option for me. Uh, but the, with this Como Connect overhaul, changing the spoke and hub to the to network, I'll be five minutes from the nearest stop. So finally, it's coming to me. It runs late enough that I can get home every day. So that's some of the big service improvements that will convince people to give it a shot. Then we're going to market this like you've never seen. Uh, we're we're going to make it free for a while. Just come on, try it. You'll love mm -hmm. it, you type thing. And, I, and I'm guessing the process will be somewhat malleable too, right, once we see how things work? Or, yes. Yeah, I mean, will there be studies going on while, while ridership and all that kind of stuff? You got it, yeah. We'll be, you know, we're, we're getting here because we're listening to our customers. And so we're not going to stop after we, we flip the switch. We're going to make sure it's what they need. Okay. Um, one thing to move on to is there's a lot in the budget. We probably won't get to all of it today, but one to talk about um, is the CAT TV funding. Mm -hmm. um, I will mention that this program does air on CAT TV, although this is a program of RJI and KBIA. We don't actually receive any funding from CAT TV for the program. Get that disclaimer out there. We just provide this to them as a service. Um, so this year in the budget, uh, the plan was to cut that $200,000 a year funding that had been a contract for five years. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain, I guess, first why you sure. thought that made sense? Uh, so the overriding goal of this year, uh, e each year we create a budget, there's sort of a whirlwind of uh, competing demands on what you want to accomplish that year in the budget. And this year, uh, the overriding uh, goal to accomplish was to balance the budget, not spend any more than, than we have coming in. Uh, CAT TV's great misfortune was to have a contract that expired this year. And so what, what that did was... Um, that was sort of an automatic reduction in expenditure. But what, but what that created for me was a situation where to find new dollars for a, a renewal, I literally have to find somewhere to cut it out of the rest of the budget because we can't, we can't get deficit, right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in that calculus, you know, they lose because uh, I don't have a general fund function in the city that I can cut to fund CAT TV. That's to say nothing of the value they have to the community. It's not even recognizing that there's a value there. It's just purely a dollars thing. So uh, the, what the council did on Saturday, we had a conversation about, uh, and I think there's consensus on council that they do value CAT TV. Uh, there's been some confusion, by the way, uh, in public contact with me, so maybe I can use this to sort of clear sure. it up. Uh, a lot of people are wondering why we're uh, proposing to cut uh, public television. Uh, well, I can stress to you, this is not the public television uh, station. It's there's there's four stations. I think people kind of wrap up into the same thing sometimes. One is public television, uh, with public broadcasting mm -hmm. system, and then there are three called PEG channels. Uh, so that's public education government. So there's the city channel, there's the channel for the school district, and then there's the public access. So what we're talking about is public access and not the other three. Uh, and, and so to that end, uh, the council talked about wanting to find some way to uh, not just cut them to zero. And that is the council's track record, by the way. Even throughout this budget cutting uh, series of years, um, they have almost always uh, decided to take longer to balance and string out the cuts. Mm -hmm. They still make the cuts, but they, they give a... a period of time to soften the blow, you might say. So what might that look like? Maybe half funding? And where would that come from, I guess? Right. So they, they talked on Saturday at our budget workshop about other areas they could pull from. And so what they made clear to me was they don't want to go into deficit to fund CAT TV, but they do want to look for dollars that could be shifted over, one of which is the council's contingency fund, uh, which is for this purpose, but it's only 100000 a year. And then another source that is kind of compelling, we had a surplus last year, and we carried over uh, a number of funds. $200,000 one time is out there that we could use for this purpose. So they, they mentioned that, and I think they're uh, wanting to also uh, explore the idea of making the funding contingent on fundraising on behalf of CAT TV. So Jennifer Erickson and her team has done a good job raising money on their own 
and, and that's grown over the last two years. And so council was talking about ways to uh, put our money on the table, but then, uh, you know, have that sort of be a match for other fundraising. Okay. Um, another thing we'll jump to now is we haven't talked about, but is a pretty big part of the general revenue budget anyway, is the pension system in the yes. city. Uh, $16 million, I think, mm-hmm. out of maybe 81 for the general revenue. Um, so what, first off, for those who may not be familiar with the situation, what is, what is all that money going toward in the pension system? Well, uh, so pensions are the the one thing that the city government does that's um, uh, sort of more than the private sector does, right? Everything else, we, we pay a little less, the benefits are a little less attractive than the private sector, but the pensions where we sort of have historically made that up. And so uh, about 15 years ago, and again about 10 years ago, uh, uh, through the sort of labor negotiation process, we sort of sweetened the pensions because we couldn't do much of a salary increase. In hindsight, that was a devastating decision. Uh, but at the time, it made sense. And so I can't blame the folks then. Uh, I probably would have made the same decision. But in hindsight, with the recession, it's really uh, been hard to fund. So uh, the $16 million is right. About half of that comes from the general fund, half for the other funds that okay. we have. So. Um, about 10% of the general fund is, is pension. Now, the frustrating thing for the community is, well, that doesn't buy you anything, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, now, I would say it does buy you something. It buys you, uh, you know, police officers who don't, uh, who don't leave, you know, 10 years into the job after they're finally become excellent. You know, it takes – that's a tough job, by the way. It takes a while to become really good at it, even though we select for the best people we can find, and we mm-hmm. find great people. It does take a while to, to really get good at it. So uh, the pension is our main tool to keep folks here after they get good uh, mm-hmm. at their job. So that there is a value to it. But, but also a lot of the pension funding is paying off old pensions, correct? Yes. I mean, yeah. uh, and, and the mayor has said, and he says it well, that, you know, pensions uh, are paying for uh, past employees, you know, not, not so much current ones. So it's a little mix of both. There's, there's about three things it does. Uh, so... Yes, that's true, and that's a commitment we made, and we have to keep those promises. So what we did uh, last year, we the mayor rightfully called out this problem and said we've got to fix this problem. We have $100 million of unfunded uh, liability, We're, so we owe it, but we don't have the money to pay for mm-hmm. it. So uh, worked with employees last year, and they, uh, they did a phenomenal job, and we came up with a way to squeeze $50 million of that out of the t- off the table, pull it off the table over the next 20 years. And what that does is it gets us to what the industry uh, calls healthy. Uh, so 80% of your liabilities need to be funded to be considered healthy. And that'll get us there in 20 years. We're not there. Mm-hmm. So what that means in the short term is our, uh, for the f- next three or four years, uh, so last year we would have said four years, now we'll say three years, uh, the costs are going to rise. But then we're going to turn a corner, and it's going to start to cost less each year until we end up actually saving money on, on pension. Uh, so the early years cost more. The, out, the last 17 years will, will be a savings. So it's the right thing to do, even though it's a little painful now. Interestingly enough, uh, we have an additional $1 million in pension this year in this budget to, to accommodate that. And that's less than it would have been without the changes. So uh, when people want to know where we're spending our money, uh, unfortunately, the pension eats a lot of it. Uh, we really don't have a choice about that. We have to we have to keep our promise there. But we have made the right choices for the future, and that will get uh, smaller in the out years. Yeah, but I guess how big of a hindrance is it, especially for these three or four years? Like you said, you're really well, kind of taking a hit for these three or four we years. We are, uh, and it's based on, again, decisions – uh, that take 10 years to, for those pigeons to come roost, right? And so uh, w- what we found is in the last 10 years, there's, uh, there's, t- there's $10 million in annual spend we could be doing other things with uh, than pension if we hadn't changed them. Well, that's easy to say. It's hindsight. Uh, but uh, so that's, that's the level of, of impact we're talking here. As the pension begins to become more affordable over time, you know, we'll feel that, but it's going to be incremental. It's going to be a hundred thousand three years from now, and then maybe two hundred thousand a year after that, and another hundred thousand after that. So it's it's kind of like a high water mark uh, coming back down. It'll take a while. 
are there really any other options? I mean, it kind of sounds like you're saying, I mean, we're obligated to this. We are obligated to it. There really aren't any other options. Uh, I think we've done the hard work to fix it. Unfortunately, uh, you know, another way to uh, common uh, way to say it is it took us 20 years to get in this mess, right? So it's going to take us 20 years to get out. And that's absolutely true with pension. Okay. I want to take a moment to remind our listeners that this is Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Famuliner, and today Columbia City Manager Mike Mathis is joining us in studio to talk about his proposed city budget for next year and about what it could mean for Columbia if approved. We're also talking about some of the other issues facing the city. For you and our audience, do you have any questions for the city manager? Go ahead and ask him. Give us a call at 573-882-8925 or email intersection at kbia.org. You could also tweet us at Intersect KBIA. I mentioned a few times during the show today that we uh, curated some questions from some of our past guests here on Intersection, and we're uh, going to bring one in. We actually recorded this one uh, before the show. Uh, uh, actually, two former guests had questions about a similar topic, about race relations in the city. Uh, not quite as related to our budget discussion, but something we want to talk about anyway. Pat Fowler, uh, the former president of the North Central Columbia Neighborhood Association, recorded this question before the show. There's an oft-repeated saying that organizations will expend their resources all around an issue before they finally, and near exhaustion, do the work of getting to the real cause of a problem. This past Monday, during the budget hearings, Amy Camp, the chair of the Community Services Advisory Commission, spoke eloquently regarding one of our most difficult challenges, and I'm quoting her. Persistent social, economic, health, and educational disparities among races continue to be of great concern. African Americans in Colombia experience disproportionately high rates of poverty and unemployment and low rates of home ownership and educational attainment. Because these disparities must be recognized and addressed, our performance measures and analysis work are intentionally inclusive of disparately affected subpopulations and their respective inequities. That group wants to measure their progress. I would like to know why we aren't making more progress. Mr. Mathis, because you control an annual budget of over $400 million, you are in the unique position of being able to gain the attention of business and university leaders in our community, perhaps better than our unpaid elected officials. What can you do as city manager to convene a discussion of race and economic class in Columbia and move us along that path to seek to understand the root causes of economic disparity in our community? Thank you. Pat never asked one line uh, answered questions this year. Uh, I we love gave it. her some time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, excellent question. You're right, of course. I mean, the anyone who looks at the uh, uh, the data should be concerned. You know, uh, there is a disparity among the races. Uh, people that say there isn't, um, it's not true. There, there is. The uh, the question, the hard question, is what can we do about it? How, you know, we'd love to move the needle on this, uh, and uh, I think we all understand that we'd all be better off if that disparity wasn't there. So we we each do our our part, and you you know, I mean, the schools have been talking about it. They're doing what they can. They they highlight the fact that they have a tremendous uh, free and reduced lunch uh, and a growing population there. Uh, and the city government does does its part. The university does their part. And you might say, well, what is that? What are you doing? <laughs> so I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it, and it gets down to real-world actions. It's not um, programmatic as much as it is, you know, we, we offer probably more jobs for folks that don't need a university, you know, degree, for example, than maybe any other entity in, in, in town. The university actually has quite a number of those as well. So the thought is, you know, what kind of apprenticeship programs can we develop uh, where we can really uh, target uh, our, our jobs to the community that is underserved? And, uh, and I think many people would say uh, sort of locked out. Uh, I think, you know, I think the city can be proud of its track record, but it's, uh, it's not done yet. It's not there yet. And, uh, in fact, Michael Trapp... Uh, uh, member, second ward uh, council member has been having this conversation with us. He came into the cabinet meeting. Uh, that's the senior leadership of the of the uh, administrative side, so department directors, and talked about ideas that we could use to move forward. And so, uh, this apprenticeship program is something that's really caught on, and especially in public works. 
if you think about it, uh, you know, uh, beyond just trash collection and, and those sort of physical jobs, there are jobs you can train for over time and bring people along. Maybe even let's take being an engineer. You have to be willing to go get a, a seriously difficult degree. <laughs> you know, it takes a lot of a uh, lot of effort. But there are things you can do to be exposed to that. Uh, ahead of time and to really kind of get a sense is that something I want to try or not so apprenticeship programs are something we're we're beginning to explore okay to, to move that needle if, uh, Tyree Bindham who's a community leader and talk show host also gave mm -hmm. us a couple questions on, on a, basically the same topic and uh, his first question was that the city of Columbia has always had the reputation of a diverse city but the locals have always said we're not a united city what are your plans to make the city more united and is that even a goal well, I'd love to. Uh, you know, you, you get things done a lot more quickly when everyone is uh, rowing the same direction in the boat, right? Unfortunately, democracy is sloppy that way. You know, you, you can't force people to change their mind. You have to convince them uh, that something is, one, worth their time, and two, the right thing to do, uh, and that they should get involved. Uh, three, well, we have trouble in Colombia getting that first one done, right? We don't agree necessarily all the time. Uh, you know, you, you could get the Eagle and KBIA uh, together <laughs> side by side if you could listen to both. You're probably not coming to the same conclusions about about a lot of a lot of things. And there is some room for of agreement. In fact, in my job, that's my that's my primary role is to find those things where there is agreement. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, council members are, are kind of like the community in, in many ways. They have different opinions about any particular topic. And so we look for that middle ground where people can agree on it. And then if there is some, uh, we look for specific things we can do to uh, fulfill the needs of both, um, uh, you know, primary philosophies. But uh, in, in Columbia, we're blessed to have many different political philosophies at the table. Mm -hmm. And it, it creates a richness and a quality of life that is hard to find other places. Uh, it's also really hard to make the, everyone happy, you know. Uh, so uh, that being said, um, you know, that unity, it's interesting. It happens when we're in crisis, you know, that human nature. You know, if the, if the flood comes, we're a pretty unified place, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so when the heat's off, though, uh, it, it's much harder to find that that unification impulse. In fact, sometimes you look at uh, what's happened to newspapers online in the comments section. You know, there's nothing unified about that. <laughs> it's more. It feels more like a pot shot type uh, uh, thing where people are anonymous and and mm -hmm. say things they would never say uh, in person. Well, and, and Tyree, one of his follow-up questions may get to, like you said, it sounds like there's very limited things the city can do is maybe what I'm, what I'm getting from you here. But one example he said is uh, there are minorities in the city that have a few issues with minority inclusion in regards to cultural activities that are offered for them in Como. What are some of your plans to address this disparity and what adjustments could be made in the Office of Cultural Affairs? For example, when it comes to the unveiling of the annual art choice, there are seldom any minorities present, present for that fundraiser. Well, you know, I, I'll just say I, I feel like there have been, and, and for cultural arts especially, uh, a lot of that is uh, it's open. You know, come on, come on down. Mm -hmm. Help us change things if, if it doesn't look right to you. And uh, there are, there are you know, many different demographic groups represented in, in culture, uh, cultural arts. Uh, now, I think his point uh, is well taken, though, at the same time. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I'm happy to work with anyone who's got a specific idea about that. Uh, we've just hired a new director of cultural arts, J.J. Uh, Musgrove, who, who I know well and uh, I think will serve us really well. Uh, tremendous background in uh, uh, fundraising and strategic planning, coaching, uh, nonprofit development, etc. So I think uh, I think Tyree will find uh, JJ to be uh, a compelling choice and and can uh, really work well with Tyree to address his concerns. Okay, we have a few minutes before the end of the show, and we did have a question. Uh, someone called in and had to go, but uh, Robbie called in with a question about Battle High School. He wondered how Battle High School would affect the city in the future. Great question. You know, uh, there are folks who will tell you that development follows high schools. And uh, certainly that's been the history in, in Colombia. Uh, 
there's a lot of infrastructure that's been built to support that high school. Uh, there's already development starting around it. Uh, I believe it will develop. People kind of want to live close to schools. And that's quite a school. I mean, we can be proud of that, uh, that school. And, uh, you know, so we're already serving it from the city government with a, a school resource officer, uh, one of our best. Uh, and uh, that's one immediate thing. Long term, I believe it will annex into the city and we'll provide all of the other city services that a, that a high school needs. So uh, police and fire, stormwater, you know, parks, et cetera. In fact, we have parkland just north of that high school already. So it's, um, it's definitely something that, uh, you know, we will serve. All of our services will be provided there. And uh, it, it's not cheap, but uh, the development does tend to, you know, contribute to the cost of that. Uh, that work. Well, and you mentioned it. This is not actually annexed in the city yet, so I'm guessing that's kind of holding up some of the progress on on this. These, but do you see any any other challenges as far as that infrastructure around that area? Well, I think a lot of people worked pretty hard to get that infrastructure ship shape. Uh, uh, Dan Atwell, the county's worked uh, pretty hard on Route Z. Uh, our public works department has worked very well uh, with uh, with the county too. And so Clark Lane's getting better. There's two roundabouts that are uh, pretty well finished at this point. So, uh, yeah, the infrastructure, the sewers in, you know, it's, it's there at this point. So I'll, you, you probably remember a conversation before that was somewhat critical that the school got, you know, chosen to be there and there wasn't the infrastructure there yet, uh, but it is now. So I think uh, uh, those issues have been largely addressed. Okay. And those uh, three new police hires, do they have anything involved? Are they going to be involved in that area as well or – is it just going to be a shift in existing police? Well, we're going to we're going to put that where uh, they're needed most. So, so the neighborhoods w within which we have our greatest uh, number of phone calls for calls for help, uh, we'll, we'll put those folks there. Okay, um, and then I guess too, as far as working with battle, though, is it just going to be a shift in? Everything else, in the, as far as where the police cover and that yes, kind of thing. Yes. So uh, our senior res or uh, school resource officer uh, is moving from the middle schools to that high school. So we'll have each high school will have a school resource officer. The middle schools won't now. Now, in a sense, I'm less concerned about that than I would have been before because uh, uh, the school district is changing those right. So the ninth graders are moving from middle school to uh, high school. I think so. Um, you know, there's there's less behavior issues with 7th and 8th graders than there are with ninth graders. So that's just human uh, nature. Uh, if you remember how um, we all were in ninth grade, you probably remember that. So uh, uh, now that said, we still need resource officers in the middle schools eventually, and, and we're going to be working on that. But the, the concern is uh, significantly smaller. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for today's intersection. Uh, we'd like to thank our guest, uh, Columbia City Manager Mike Mathis, who joined us in studio today. And thanks, too, to all those who sent us questions to help guide today's conversation. We'd like to remind those of you enjoying this as a rebroadcast that Intersection takes place live for a full hour from 2 to 3 every Monday afternoon. You can watch live streaming video of our program each Monday afternoon online at kbia.org. Alongside that video, you can submit your questions and comments and take part in an online discussion with others in the audience. You'll also find an archive of all of our past programs including the full hour of today's conversation. Intersection is a broadcast from the Reynolds Journalism Institute and is a project of RJI and KBIA. Intersection is produced by Raymond Tungakar, Janet Saidi, and Ruben Stern. Travis McMillan is our technical director with production assistance from Rachel Gangware, Casey Morell, and Andrew Yost. Pat Akers is our audio producer. The executive directors are Mike Dunn and Mike McKean. And I'm Ryan from Yolander. Thanks for joining us today and have a great week. All right. <laughs>